Good morning and good afternoon to everyone. Um, um, I have the pleasure of moderating panel two, um, which considers the issue uh, of consent as a cornerstone of human rights at sea arbitration. Uh, and I will be moderating a panel of three panelists, uh, Emmanuel Gaillard, uh, James uh, M. Turner QC, and Robin Willing. Um, now, the way that we're going to structure uh, our presentation uh, or panel is that each panelist will provide a brief presentation, uh, following which um, I will then host a brief panel discussion, time permitting, uh, arising from the, uh, the presentations. And then as noted, at the end of this panel, there will be general uh, Q&A, I understand. So just a few brief introductory uh, remarks. Um, as the white paper, um, which has been alluded to earlier uh, in this uh, webinar, states in paragraph 13, human rights at sea, uh, arbitration is not a silver bullet. Um, and a detailed discussion with all stakeholders and rigorous analysis are required to calibrate the systems optimally, uh, including as regards transparency levels. In the same passage, it notes two central challenges pertain to securing the necessary stakeholders' consent to arbitration and to the cost burden, as arbitration in this classic form rests on party consent and is privately funded by its users. So as a result, uh, this panel will focus on the notion of consent uh, as a necessary feature of human rights at sea, arbitration, um, I think there was an earlier reference to consent being the alpha and omega of arbitration, or indeed the cornerstone of arbitration. And in addition, we'll be looking at some key issues and possible uh, solutions uh, to this issue. So the first panelist uh, who's going to address this part of this panel on consent is Emmanuel Gaillard. Um, for those in the arbitration world, he needs no introduction. Uh, Emmanuel founded and heads Sherman Sterling's international arbitration practice. Uh, he's also the firm's global head of disputes. Uh, a professor of law in France, uh, he serves as a visiting professor of law at the Yale Law School and also at Harvard Law School. Uh, Emmanuel has advised and represented companies, uh, states and state-owned entities uh, in hundreds of international arbitrations. Uh, he also acts as an arbitrator and as an expert witness. So that's a very brief introduction, and I could go on much longer than that. Um, I will then turn to Manuel, whose presentation will focus on first the issue of consent in international arbitration generally, uh, secondly, consent to arbitrate human rights at sea disputes, and thirdly, uh, the issue of transparency. Emmanuel, I'll leave you take the floor. Thank you. Thank you, John. I have the, the honor to discuss this very difficult topic, the consent requirement in human rights at sea arbitration. And before that, I want to say, uh, as global head of the firm and head of um, global head of uh, international arbitration at Sherman Sterling, uh, that it is a great honor to have been selected uh, to work on this project. It's a fascinating project. Everything has to be done. And if you compare it with more familiar territory for those who do international arbitration, it's like being in 65 or before 65 at the time of the negotiation of the exit convention uh, as far as um, uh, arbitration of of investment dispute uh, is concerned, everything needs to be done, uh, even if there are more general models, but as far as human rights at sea uh, is concerned, everything is to be done and the situation is really, um, is really one which, which needs a lot of attention, even if, as we have seen uh, with, uh, the, uh, with the presentation, of uh, Eric uh, Dawicki, uh, there is uh, 
also appetite, like in Dominica, uh, for uh, to do the right thing. But but there is also a lot a lot to be done. So we want to thank David David Hammond again for having uh, invited us to uh, to to think about this uh, topic. And consent is key because the rules are easy. I mean, I, to simplify, they are easy. And uh, I, I'm, I'm still at the introduction, but the the rules are easy. It's it's um, you can develop the rules or you can simply refer to the general rules uh, and si or simply say it's the normal human rights uh, rights which apply at sea. And what's difficult is to find the judge who will give a binding decision, a binding award to the victim. And the victims, because the laws are different, the, the, there are so many possible applicable laws, so many applicable places where you could litigate, it's very difficult. And there is no awareness. So what we would like to do is to raise the awareness and to couple a set of rules, substantive rules, not just applicable law approach, substantive rules, which protect the victims with access to arbitration. And for that, you need consent. And because uh, you need consent, it's a very, very difficult topic. So I will, um, I, will I will divide my presentation in two parts. One is consent in general, just to give the framework which can be used uh, in the field of human rights at sea. And then try to apply these general rules uh, to our possible models to the human rights at sea. So first, the, the consent in arbitration. Yes, uh, it's tried to say that arbitration is based on consent. Without consent, possibly, uh, at least that was the old view, with no consent, you do not have arbitration. Arbitration is by, by based on consent, two parties or more consented to have their future or existing disputes to be resolved through arbitration. It's based on, on an agreement, an agreement to arbitrate and Consent is the cornerstone, the foundation of arbitration. This is like very uh, trite. It's true uh, in commercial arbitration, and it's true, as we see on the next slide, also in investment arbitration in 65, when they adopted the exit convention, the drafters uh, used this word, uh, consent is the cornerstone of the jurisdiction uh, to jurisdiction to exit arbitration. That's, uh, that's obvious, but it needs to be said that at the same time, consent is probably one of the most difficult topics in international arbitration. There are many different topic, difficult topics, but this one is probably, certainly in my ranking, uh, the most difficult one. You have issues of uh, degree of certainty of consent, uh, in many jurisdictions, you need a clear intention to settle the dispute through arbitration. Um, you uh, do not necessarily need to give this intention in a single document, as we see in the next slide. It can be through your conduct. It's accepted that conduct can evidence consent. If you have knowledge of a certain document with an arbitration, close in it, and then you perform the obligations under this agreement, you may have consented or certain jurisdictions do accept that this is an expression of consent. You accept by performing, say, general conditions of sales, you may accept the arbitration offer, which is in such general conditions of sales, for instance. Now, there is also possibly a requirement of consent in writing, at least to benefit from the New York Convention. You have a need to have a, an agreement to arbitrate in writing, although this is a loose requirement and in writing doesn't have to be a single instrument, it can be 
It can be an email, it can be an answer, an offer in an email, the acceptance in another email, and that's consent in writing. But to benefit from the New York Convention, and that would be one of the great advantages of the project, because if you have the benefit of the New York Convention, if the decision rendered in favor of a victim of a human rights abuse at sea is an arbitral award, then it will be enforceable in most uh, jurisdictions in the world. So that's one of the uh, big benefits uh, of, um, of arbitration, but you need to have consent in the first place, consent to arbitrate and possibly consent in writing. Now the next slide, and this is a very important one, is to flag the idea that often consent is given by both parties in a single instrument. You have two parties, the seller, the buyer, and they agree to arbitrate their disputes. But in investment arbitration, because of the work of the World Bank, we know now that consent can be given in different instruments. And that's what has made invest its investment arbitration uh, very important. Um, the consent can be given by the state in a law. You can say, I will protect investors if they qualify under this law. And there is substantive protection. And it's coupled with an agreement given to a class of investors, those who qualify under this law, to arbitrate with them if they say, if they claim rightly or wrongly, that they are uh, th that this, their protection under this instrument has been violated. And it can also be given in treaties, bilateral investment treaties or multilateral investment treaties, in laws, investment treaties, bilateral and multilateral. In all of these situations, the consent to arbitrate is given to a class of investors and in advance, and that's the offer to arbitrate. Then the acceptance is given after the fact the investor is expropriated there is a dispute the investor is unhappy and the investor discovers the existence of this advanced consent given by the state and say yes i accept the consent now i will i will seize an international tribunal and that's a very important model for us uh, this dissociated consent and this model, which is the one I mentioned before, which is to couple substantive protection, the treaties do offer the protection, and they couple the substantive protection with an offer to arbitrate, which can be accepted or not by the victim later. So that's, uh, that's the model which I think is the most topical for us. Now, you also have example uh, in my next slide of forced consent, and that's sport arbitration. But in sport arbitration, uh, yes, there is consent. Uh, the uh, athlete has consented um, to arbitrate uh, before the CAS tribunal. Um, it's an arbitration system, but the athlete has no choice. If they want to participate in the games, they have to consent, but it's a sort of theoretical type of consent. Um, it, they have no choice, really. Uh, but it still qualifies as arbitration. They still consent. They have consented. And uh, then the result does qualify under the New York Convention as an award which can be enforced uh, worldwide under the New York Convention. Now, this is to be contrasted with mandatory arbitration. In certain states, Chile uh, is the... Um, the, the state which is the most advanced in this. In Chile, they have uh, said that certain issues, um, including family law aspects of uh, certain disputes, uh, can be uh, or sh have to be resolved through arbitration. And here we are in the territory of mandatory arbitration. A law can say this type of dispute will be arbitrated. That's another model which is a bit more dangerous for us because it's not clear whether mandatory arbitration is still an arbitration uh, because to qualify under the New York Convention, you need, you need consent or the agreement to arbitrate. 
So forced uh, agreement to arbitrate may not qualify, but certainly if it's mandatory, uh, it will raise uh, issues. So that's the background against which, which we are working after having uh, taken stock of the fact, as uh, Gabriel Kaufman and Thomas Schulz uh, reminded us that the classic uh, concept of arbitration based on consent today has evolved and it may not be completely true in every type of arbitration. So there is room for evolution. And against that background, I will now uh, quickly address the question of whether uh, we can secure consent uh, to, uh, to, to enable victims of human rights abuses uh, at sea to access uh, a proper arbitral uh, tribunal who will be able to render an enforceable award, enforceable uh, pretty much on a worldwide uh, basis. And that's the, one of the challenges of this work, uh, which needs to be uh, further uh, fleshed out, of course. Um, and it's clear that the choice here in this type of issue, human rights abuses at sea and, and the remedies, will have to be a victim-centered approach. Um, and it means, it means we can emulate what happened in the field of investment arbitration, have the players who should refrain from abuses or should police abuses and could be responsible for not having done so to commit not only to substantive rules but also to commit to arbitrate disputes in case someone says after the fact that they have not respected these substantive rules. So it should be a victim-centered approach. The victim can or can, can accept the offer to arbitrate or not, if they have a better, uh, a better remedy in, in, in a better jurisdiction, which may or may not exist, uh, then the victim has a choice. It's a victim-centered approach. It would be a choice and the offer to arbitrate has to be given in advance and then the victim can accept or not. And of course, the difficulty to secure advanced consent uh, to cover what uh, is generally uh, captured as, um, as human rights uh, abuses uh, at sea uh, is difficult because we have given in the next slide just an example, the workers uh, thinks of that situation, uh, workers, uh, uh, seafarers, uh, working like slaves and, and the like. There are abuses and, and we all know that. Now, the difficulty really, and this slide is also important, is that the type of abuses may be very diverse and the perpetrators may be diverse. So the key is to identify a typology of uh, cases and this is simply uh, just a few examples. The victim may be abused by the crew. Can they sue the crew or another other individuals? It may be hard to secure consent from these individuals, but, but that's typically a, a possible type of dispute. Uh, it's easy to understand a rape or, or anything um, of that nature. In, uh, in a ship. Uh, now, the victim may also have a grievance vis-a-vis uh, -vis the company employing the crew in question, vis-a-vis -vis the fishing company, the shipping company, the employer, for not having policed the attitude of uh, the crew in question, which, and there it may be a bit easier to identify who should be targeted has having given advanced consent to respect certain norms and to offer to arbitrate after the fact if there is a claim that these norms have not been respected. 
The victim similarly may want to uh, sue the ship owner or the charters, and it's true that one difficulty we are facing is that there are many players, many flags, many uh, possible applicable laws, and, and certainly a multiplicity of, uh, of uh, participants who should all ideally uh, have consented uh, in the, if we want the system to be, to arbitrate future disputes, if we want the system to be uh, efficient. Now, of course, a victim, and that's a candidate, a victim can have a grievance uh, against uh, a flag state, and it's very uh, comforting to see that some flag states want to uh, give the right example. Um, uh, and, and as opposed to others who, who want to simply be the, the easiest and the cheapest and the least uh, regarding as far as, um, as far as human rights is concerned, simply to attract as many, as many um, customers uh, as possible. Now the port state may be involved for not having done certain things. You can think of uh, situations where they, they go, they inspect, they inspect, they look for drugs, and they don't care only about drugs. They see slave, slavery situation, but they don't care. They turn a blind eye on this situation, and that may be something which can be uh, the basis of a claim from the victims against, against them. And in, in more marginal situation, possibly the coastal state may have uh, some, something uh, against them as well. But this is not meant to be exhaustive. This is simply to show that we are talking about a multiplicity of situations and ideally a charter with substantive rights, the pledge to respect human rights at sea has to be coupled with consent given by all of these categories or at least as many uh, as possible of these categories of uh, players. Now, how to secure that, uh, that's, uh, that's uh, what uh, I say in the next slide. Uh, it's, it's always the same thing. It's you can, you can try to secure, um, to secure the consent uh, afterwards by, as I say in yet the next slide, incentives or punishment. Uh, shaming and naming is, is one way. Uh, incentivizing is the other. I mean, there are no, it's simple enough. You have to put pressure and pressure can be through a reward of setting the, the, the tone, doing the right thing, or, um, or uh, by punishing those who do not uh, behave. And this can be direct or indirect pressure. Um, a lot of progress has been made in the combat against corruption, for instance, through international uh, treaties and, uh, and, and a great uh, multilateral um, activity, putting pressure on states who still have secrecy jurisdiction and now they are closing down. Uh, many states have, were very uh, lenient about um, you know, the beneficial owners of certain accounts, and now they, they cooperate internationally uh, to, to disclose the ultimate beneficial owner. And this has been achieved through uh, international pressure on certain jurisdictions by the main players. And we can see something uh, similar here through international activity or uh, pressure from other states, from intergovernmental organizations. Of course, NGOs have a huge role to play, uh, as they have done in investment arbitration, to shape and to modify the shape of uh, the system. Uh, here, it's a huge uh, field where the states can be, if they don't do the right thing uh, spontaneously, like Dominica, uh, to set to set the right uh, example, they can be named and shamed. But also incentives can come from uh, banks who will finance certain activities. 
maybe the financing can be conditioned, can be, can be conditional to the um, uh, acceptance uh, of, uh, to, of a pledge uh, to respect human rights and consent to arbitrate. And, and that can be, so the banks can have a very important uh, role to play here. Flag states, of course, can condition their, uh, the access to their uh, registries uh, easily. And that's, uh, uh, it can be done in law, it can be done simply in a document to have to fill a document to qualify, to get the flag. You want to get my flag? Fine, you have to, con to, you have to pay certain fees, but you also have to fill in a form which says that you will respect human rights and and, and that's the big progress, you will accept to arbitrate disputes in a, a specialized system or not. Um, you will offer, you will consent to arbitrate to the benefit of the victims. And later on, the victims can, um, can uh, sue you and you accept in advance uh, to be sued in arbitration for allegations of uh, human rights uh, abuses. Um, and uh, so there are lots of different uh, possibilities. Uh, the states could also theoretically uh, condition access to their ports uh, to the same pledge. Uh, you see, so we, are, uh, we have seen examples in sport arbitration and certainly in investment arbitration where the consent is given but the consent is given uh, because of certain pressure. In investment arbitration, I consent uh, to be sued because I want to attract investment. In sport arbitration, I consent to take all the dispute to CAS because I want uh, to participate in the race. Um, it's here, one would have to develop incentives and that's, uh, that's one of the purposes of this uh, discussion, to secure uh, consent to arbitrate coupled with, um, coupled with uh, substantive protection. And my last slide is simply meant to insist on the fact that any regime which we will um, uh, develop has to have, in my view, a transparency feature. Of course, traditional commercial arbitration has um, secrecy, uh, if you speak like an NGO, or uh, confidentiality, if you speak as a business person, uh, features. And it can be legitimate if two, two, two players uh, want to resolve their disputes uh, without having their, say, customers aware of what they are disputing as to the, 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 the building of the product or whatever, uh, it, it's fine. But here, there is a strong public interest in the resolution of human rights disputes at sea and everywhere. And this strongly militates in favor of having transparency, having information about how those disputes are um, resolved. And that's what we think that the default position has to be uh, transparency. Of course, here, because it's a victim-centered um, system, you could also say that the victim has the option to keep it confidential. That may be their preference. They may not want to expose their weaknesses or what happened exactly depending on the situation. And in that case, you can make it optional, but I think certainly on the side of um, the respondent, uh, the consent to make it transparent has to be given in advance. So, so that, that's one of the features uh, to specific uh, mechanism for the resolution of human rights abuses uh, at sea. Uh, and uh, it's a much broader topic, uh, how to, 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 to shape the system. Uh, and, but transparency certainly is one of the feature and consent can be given through the different uh, ways. Uh, I have canvas, so my, my, my 
strong uh, view here is that the system will be effective only when we will be able to couple substantive protection and consent to arbitrate, an advanced consent to arbitrate given by a broad category of players. And then the task will be to devise uh, something which is workable and then which would have a broad, uh, broad, uh, cons uh, broad adoption uh, uh, through um, the, the, the desire to do the right thing or simply the obligation to do the right thing uh, because of banking and, uh, and state pressures of, of different kinds. So this, this was the, the ideas I wanted to uh, develop for the beginning of this discussion. Thank you very much. Thank you, John. Thank you, Manuel, very much uh, for that uh, thoughtful and erudite uh, discussion uh, of the issue of consent uh, in such arbitration and, and how it will apply or arise uh, in the context, specific context of human, human rights abuses at sea arbitration. Uh, and I'm sure we all uh, share your excitement uh, at, the, at the inception of this, and I was interested in your analogy with the ICSID Convention. Um, right, well then, we will then, um, following Emmanuel's uh, first presentation, we will then proceed then to a presentation by James Turner. Uh, James Turner is a Queen's Counsel at Quadrant Chambers in London, uh, where he specializes in cross-border commercial disputes in international arbitration, energy, shipbuilding, offshore construction, shipping, as well as banking. Um, he appears most often uh, in, in arbitration, so very much wearing his arbitration hat as well as a shipping hat uh, before tribunals operating under various institutional rules as well as ad in ad hoc matters. Uh, James's experience as an arbitrator stretches back nearly 20 years uh, and includes ad hoc uh, LMAA, ICC, and LCIA references. So, um, James's dis uh, discussion or presentation will focus on the realities, uh, practices, and complexities of the international shipping industry, uh, including as regards this well developed dispute resolution and insurance uh, its structures. Uh, so with that um, introduction, James, I will hand the floor to you. Thank you very much, John, uh, and good afternoon, everybody. I'd like to start by thanking Human Rights at Sea and Chairman and Sterling for inviting me to take part in this important webinar. I would also like to congratulate them on the thoughtful and thought-provoking white paper. I have no doubt that arbitration is a sound process by which allegations of maritime human rights violations might be adjudicated. If I have a concern, it is that the institutional solution which the white paper proposes might jar with the existing structures and practices of the commercial shipping industry. And let me make it plain at the outset that I claim no special knowledge of, and I'm not addressing, the complexities of the fishing industry or seaborne migration, both of which throw up very pressing human rights issues. Uh, and nor can I do more than touch on the role of states. What I do know something about though, is the commercial shipping industry. And I hope that by sharing at least some of that knowledge, I might be able to move the debate and the project on from the drawing board to the rather messier shop floor. Now, this session is all about consent, and inevitably there's going to be a bit of overlap between uh, what I have to say and what Maitre Gaillard uh, had to say in the previous presentation. But what do we mean um, by consent? And there is, of course, the narrow technical meaning of consent to the arbitration process, without which it cannot get off the ground. And this requirement is capable of being both overplayed and overlooked overplayed because it is nearly always possible to refer a dispute to arbitration, even if the underlying contract has no arbitration clause, uh, or even if there's no underlying contract at all. And it's overlooked because it is so fundamental and because it may take a lot to lead the horse of alleged human rights violator to the water of arbitration. 
My real interest for today's purposes is not the narrow meaning of consent, but the broader question of industry consensus, without which, of course, there will be little, if any, consent. My concerns come under six broad headings, complexity, cost, insurance, confidence, confidentiality, and flags of convenience uh, and similar considerations. Now, you and I might look at a ship. You might even see the ship, but I will see a seething mass of rights and obligations, chiefly contractual, but also regulatory, proprietary and possessory with potential for the laws of tort and restitution to get stuck in as well. I could, but I won't, keep going all day, dealing with the complexities that can arise in relation to ownership and financing structures, commercial management and time chartering, voyage charters and the carriage of goods under bills of lading. Um, I was impressed by previous speakers referring copiously to the Hague rules. The Hague rules have a completely different meaning to shipping lawyers, I can promise you. They've been around for a lot longer. Uh, crewing contracts, insurance, which comes in multiple flavors, hull and machinery, war risks, protecting an indemnity, freight to margin dispatch, and so on, and defense, I should say, and so on. Flag state regulation, classification societies, uh, and technical management. The points to note for present purposes are these. These are entirely mainstream elements of the shipping industry. And every element of these various aspects can be, and often is, located in or governed by the law of a different country. It would not take much imagination to conjure a factual scenario involving an alleged human rights violation that also implicated two, three, or four, or more different parties, each located in a different jurisdiction and with a different legal stake in the process. It goes without saying that whatever system is put in place or adapted to adjudicate human rights disputes will have to be able to handle this sort of complexity. Virtually any fair process involving the adjudication of allegedly offended rights is likely to involve lawyers and therefore cost. Cost that may be increased if the laws of different states have to be investigated in order to dispose of the claim fairly. It is also fair to say that institutional arbitration tends to be more expensive than ad hoc arbitration. That is because the institution must itself be supported financially. And this is achieved in no small measure by the fees charged to the participants in the arbitral process. The success in maritime commercial dispute resolution of the relatively unsophisticated LMAA approach is at least partly due to the relatively low cost and higher speed of its process compared to that of its institutional rivals. And just to give you a flavor of that, the LMAA has around about 1,500 to, to 2,000 uh, arbitrations commenced under its rules each year. Uh, and that is uh, a, a multiple of the combined total of the ICC and the LCIA. Now, I'm not saying that the institutional model should be rejected out of hand but the additional cost of that approach cannot be ignored. And I say that because it may well meet resistance from an industry that is use, used to the relatively low cost of ad hoc arbitration. Continuing the cost theme, it's important to understand that in many maritime disputes, ship owners and other participants do not fund their legal spend from their own pockets. They look instead to their P&I and FD&D cover. P&I clubs and FD&D insurers are very sophisticated operators. Many employ large numbers of experienced disputes lawyers and handle many of their members' claims without ever involving outside counsel. And their role in the industry cannot be ignored. Uh, and uh, just picking up on a question that was asked um, just before I came on, it's worth bearing in mind that P&I clubs are owned by their members it's all very well putting pressure on a PNI club from the outside. You have to remember that it's their members that they answer to, and those are uh, the ship owners and charterers uh, who subscribe to them. Most importantly, 
so far as I am aware, specific cover is not yet available against allegations of human rights violation. This is an important work of further, uh, oh, I'm sorry, an important area of further work for the project. For any system to prompt buy-in from the industry, its insurers must be persuaded not only to offer suitable cover, but also that that system is a fair, efficient and cost-effective means of revolving disputes falling within that cover. In addition, any entrant to the maritime arbitration market will be faced with the embedded preeminence of the LMAA, with which the P&I clubs and FD&D insurers are very familiar. For a dispute resolution service to survive and thrive, it must command trust. To achieve that, it must at a minimum be equipped to address and therefore to understand not just the core allegations, but the commercial systems that provide their context. As important as it will be for tribunals to include expertise on human rights and employment law, shipping expertise will also be vital if they are to command the respect and trust of commercial entities and flag states. The system's rules will also need to be able to accommodate complex uh, multi-party disputes. Uh, the white paper proposes an active roster of arbitrators. I have to say, um, with the greatest respect, that sounds to me like a closed list. I seriously question whether that is the right way to go, particularly if the roster were to be comprised of those who specialize not in shipping, but in human rights law. Then there is confidentiality. One of the cornerstones of commercial arbitration, under English law and many others besides, is that it is confidential to those involved in the process. Now there are many exceptions to this, but as a starting point, the confidentiality of the arbitral process retains real force. The starting point of the system proposed in the white paper, by contrast, is transparency. There's an obvious tension here. It may be said with some force uh, that those guilty of human rights abuses should not be entitled uh, to its protection. However, that argument leaves out of account the need for consent. And it is fair to doubt whether the prospect of public opprobrium will be a particular incentive to commercial parties to sign up. Now, flags of convenience uh, are flown by a very sizable proportion of the world's fleet. Uh, and they are not generally regarded as a good thing. Uh, and it is not therefore desirable to encourage their use. For the system envisaged by the white paper to make a material impact, it is vital either to discourage the use of um, flags of convenience or to encourage flags of convenience countries to mandate use of the system. Uh, and it's not obvious to me how either is to be achieved. The danger is that the existence of the system and its encouragement by more responsible flags may act as a further incentive to fly flags of convenience. And I, I'm not ignoring the points made by Emmanuel Gaillard, but if one looks in the, the, the not unrelated area of ship recycling, uh, one can see that the um, impact of the Basel Convention and the EU ship recycling and waste shipment regulations is such that it simply doesn't make a commercial sense for uh, more expensive flags to be flown. The law, uh, the next point is that the law governing uh, seafarers employment contracts provides an analogous problem. That law may typically not be one that offers a high level of protection of em employees rights. To that extent, the availability of a forum which did offer such protection would be welcome. But it's diff difficult to envisage, envisage those with a stake in the current system being infused by that prospect. To the contrary, it's more likely that they will object to and resent what may be perceived to be Western interference in their legal systems and values, especially if the institution is to be headquartered in a first world European capital. Now, uh, more positively, Human Rights at Sea has achieved considerable excess, uh, success, I should say, in garnering support from India in particular, which is uh, one of, I should think, three or four very important jurisdictions when it comes to ships' crews 
And this is capable of being an important plank for the encouragement to take up of any new system. And no doubt that will be explored further in due course. As part of that exploration, thought should also be given, um, if I may suggest, to a, an alternative seat of arbitration in a venue that is more accessible geographically, such as Singapore, which is a neutral venue that is well known and respected within the shipping industry. My overarching concern uh, with the white paper is that its outlook is very much at human rights and international arbitration centric. And we need to pay attention to the elephant in the room here. Um, that elephant comprises the realities, practices and complexities of the international shipping industry, particularly as regards its well-developed dispute resolution and insurance structures. That's all for me for now. Thank you very much for your attention. James, uh, thank you very much um, for that uh, critique of the, of the white paper, uh, and particularly the, the, the challenges of uh, procuring consent uh, to the institutional model. And perhaps we'll come back to that in a moment. Uh, in, in the context in the shipping industry, uh, having regard both to the availability of insurance coverage uh, and also to the potential transparency uh, of the proceedings. So thank you very much for that. I think that's a very welcome uh, critique, uh, a voice that needs to be heard. And I think one can only con that one would only contribute uh, to, to this um, to the development of this idea. Um, so turning to the third uh, panelist, uh, having heard from two uh, preeminent lawyers, uh, we're now going to hear from somebody in the banking sector. Uh, his name is Robin Willing. Uh, Robin is a senior sustainability officer at NIBC Bank, uh, based in Amsterdam. And at NIBC Bank, he has overall responsibility for sustainability, ESG, and uh, corporate social responsibility. Um, Robin has developed in NIBC's sustainable finance framework. Uh, he is also involved in sustainability and ethics policy development and implementation, including the bank's code of conduct, uh, as well as ESG assessments, due diligence, and monitoring, including human rights due diligence. Um, so Robin's uh, insights are going to be especially welcome. His presentation will focus on human rights in corporate lending, uh, including his uh, explanation of responsible ship recycling standards, as well as the International Responsible Business Conduct Agreement. Uh, so with that introduction, uh, I'll hand the floor to uh, Robin. Let's see, thanks, John. Um, hopefully you can hear me and soon, um, soon see me, if this is all working uh, properly. I'm uh, Robin Willing. I'm responsible for sustainability at NIBC. I'm actually the head of sustainability, so in the title, depending on, on how you want to look at it. It's really an honor to be one of the panelists on this webinar and to speak with all of you today. I'd like to compliment David and the team at Human Rights at Sea and the team at uh, Sherman and Sterling on their efforts to date on the, on the white paper. And um, it really goes in line with some of our own um, thinking on human rights and the need to create um, ecosystems which, uh, which fully support uh, human rights in all sectors, to be honest. First, a brief introduction about um, NIBC it, itself. We're a mid-sized retail and commercial bank, actually based in The Hague in the Netherlands. Um, it was nice hearing the panelists earlier because we're located directly across the street. Our headquarters is from the uh, Peace Palace in The Hague, where where the, the um, various developments have been taking place on human rights recently. We were, we were established in 1945, so this is actually our 75th anniversary year to help build the Dutch economy after World War II. Um, currently, we have operations in the Netherlands, Germany, Belgium, and the UK. Um, and within our corporate banking uh, unit, we focus on a limited number of sectors, but these include shipping and offshore energy services. So we really are involved in maritime um, activities. 
Within, um, within that, uh, we perform human rights due diligence for 100% of our corporate loans and investments. I'm quite involved in, in that effort and uh, my colleagues as well, and I'll explain a little bit further. It probably helps a bit when you see or hear about it a bit more in practice. Um, among the core human rights uh, related policy commitments of NIBC are the human, the Universal De Declaration of Human Rights, the OECD guidelines, the UN guiding principles, um, ILO core conventions. Um, on the screen, you see a, a big piece that uh, you would both see on the Human Rights at Sea website, but also in our human rights policy. So I give you a uh, reference directly to our own policies that we we have embedded human rights at sea uh, because we feel it's so important and so material to the sectors that we're operating in. Uh, we're one of the founding members of what are called the responsible ship recycling standards. This is a focus on supply chains in the uh, maritime sector. Um, Currently nine banks are involved. Their logos are up on the screen so you can see everybody that's been involved. But we, we started this initiative together with ABN AMRO and ING with a view towards strengthening um, human rights and environmental standards within the full shipping value chain. And we're focused, uh, it started by focusing on one end of the value, value chain and I'll explain that. But uh, importantly, it was developed with strong cooperation with our clients and, and ship owners, um, with, with NGOs, with uh, national authorities and other, other stakeholders. Um, the, the standards themselves um, embed core commitments in financial contracts, which is very interesting, I think, for the discussion today and for this group. Um, these include uh, obtaining and maintaining an inventory of hazardous materials for the vessels that we finance. Um, usually this is to be achieved at the next dry dock or within a year um, in the case of, or for refinancing of existing ships. So that it, it depends a little bit on, on what and when we give a bit of flexibility there so owners can live up to it. Um, clients are encouraged to extend this to all or at least part of their fleet in addition to the, to the um, uh, ship we finance. Um, we require uh, dismantling according to the Hong Kong Convention and or EU uh, standards. Dismantling according to the Hong Kong Conventions and the um, EU uh, regulations. Um, probably addressing one of the points from the prior presentation. We, we require this regardless of the flag of the vessel. So even for non-EU flagged vessels, we require compliance with these standards and, and we lean much more strongly towards the EU regulations than purely the Hong Kong Convention for, for a lot of different reasons. Um, we also avoid uh, or ask, uh, ask our, our, the ship owners to avoid irresponsible practices, which are often linked to cash buyers, um, for those familiar with that. Um, and, and beyond that, to exemplify transparency in, in several different ways, such as to, to uh, develop a, a company policy in regard to a responsible dismantling, publish policies or policy statements on, on their website, um, preferably in a way that's, that's really publicly available and to promote um, better practices within the shipping sector. And I think this is um, quite important for, uh, for what we're talking about uh, today. We are also involved as one of the banks in the International Responsible Business Conduct Agreement of the Dutch banking sector. Um, this was a, uh, an agreement that we signed three years ago. Most of the um, large Dutch banks are signatories uh, of this, so ABN AMRO, ING, uh, Rabobank, et cetera. Um, there's a focus uh, within the Dutch, uh, Dutch banking agreement, as we call it, um, on human rights responsibilities uh, as defined by the main international standards, particularly the OECD guidelines and the uh, UN guiding principles on business and human rights were a focus point within this. And uh, within the UN guiding principles, particularly the UNGP reporting framework, so to be more transparent about what's happening in regard to our, um, 
financings and investments. Other parties to the agreement included civil society organizations like uh, Oxfam and Amnesty, um, trade unions, um, national authorities like the Ministry of Foreign Affairs and the Ministry of Finance, and the socio socioeconomic board or SARE here in the Netherlands. Uh, there were several working groups within this agreement that were created, including one on enabling remediation. And we've shared uh, this work uh, in the enabling remediation working group and, and the other working groups with the OECD and the UN Office of the High Commissioner on Human Rights. Uh, the final report of the, of the agreement will be published shortly, I think in the coming few weeks. So, so you can check on the um, SARE website actually uh, uh, for this information, or if anyone wants to contact me, I can uh, give you the links. The, um, the uh, agreement itself um, and the paper on enabling remedy, um, probably just a few things to mention there because it, it uh, covers a lot of the things that others have, have already mentioned, but, but it, it um, recognizes the bank's responsibility and business responsibility to um, establish or participate in effective operational level grievance mechanisms. And I think that's really important for, for this discussion. Um, in, in our discussions, we recognize that industry sector mechanisms are one of these and complement judicial and non-judicial processes, company mechanisms and other state mechanisms. Um, they, they play a variety of different roles, including providing effective remedy to stakeholders, um, serving as a feedback loop as part of ongoing company due diligence uh, by identifying impacts, potentially ones that we don't see as opposed to the risks, and as an indication of the effectiveness of the prevention and, and mitigation measures that are, also, that are often part of corporate governance. Um, importantly, these hold holding companies accountable for um, the commitments they make. So I think that's a key part of what we, what our role is and, and how we're trying to carry it out. We view effectiveness as being uh, legitimate, accessible, predictable, equitable, transparent, um, rights compatible, uh, a source of continuous learning. The banks actually set up their own learning mechanism, which is hosted at the Dutch Banking Association. And uh, it's based on continuous uh, uh, dialogue. Um, one of the things that I think is a is a learning is 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 uh, for us processes become most effective when when they're truly stakeholder driven, um, informed and guided by the different perspectives that different stakeholders have, and also the desired outcomes of those that, that have been uh, adversely affected. The the paper also recognizes the the need to build a broad grievance and remedy ecosystem, and this maybe speaks to John's point about um, there is no one silver bullet, but instead we really need an ecosystem where there are different actors playing different but complementary roles, um, different arbitration mechanisms or grievance mechanisms which can help to address these, and preferably the parties that are aggrieved can choose the one that's closest to them or which they, they believe is most transparent or, or effective for them. Um, action is required by all parties that, that have caused or contributed to or are directly linked to the harm. Um, typically banks uh, fall into that latter category of directly linked as financiers um, and therefore are compelled to actually help uh, bring parties to the table if, if necessary. When, when negative impacts occur, um, all of us, every actor that's within the value chain and connected to it, have some kind of responsibility to take action to address those impacts. Affected stakeholders may in many cases um, uh, raise, uh, many, uh, many may in many cases uh, need different forms of support in order to access and participate effectively. Um, and we recognize that. Businesses connected to the impact, um, governments, civil society organizations, trade unions, all may have different complementary and supporting roles in this. We heard a few of them earlier today, but I think it's important to recognize that all actors have a role in this and, and to enable remedy in practice. Um, so, so a robust grievance infrastructure really includes company level, state-based and sectoral 
mechanisms. Our, our main role as banks is an influencing role in using our leverage to, to encourage clients to cooperate in good faith, hopefully addressing some of those transparency issues with uh, third party processes and to, and to seek a consensual resolution with affected, uh, with affected parties. Um, that's what I wanted to, to speak to because I think it's really important to, to uh, mention where banks are on this. I think this shows that we're interested in building, building up uh, uh, our role in terms of helping to, uh, to bring parties to the table and really begin to uh, address the concerns that uh, uh, people are, are facing when they, when they have been impacted. Um, importantly, I, I think it is a complementary role to what other parties have mentioned uh, earlier today. And I think, um, I think we can uh, achieve this in, in different ways, whether it's, uh, whether it's through uh, uh, building, building more detailed uh, uh, requirements into uh, agreements like the responsible ship recycling standards. We are openly talking about that with um, NGOs and other third parties, how we might um, build in uh, certain human rights standards as part of the, as part of the um, standards and uh, therefore included in financial agreements, they're, thereby enabling other parties that are involved in the, uh, in the value chain to bring things forward a little bit more easily because then it is a legal obligation and it's hard to uh, ignore if it's, uh, if it's in a financial agreement. But there are a number of ways that, uh, that this can be taken forward. Um, with that, I think I'll turn it back over to, um, to John and I think we can move on, yeah. Rob, thank you very much for your presentation. Um, I, I very much liked your, uh, among other things, the use of the word ecosystem. Um, I thought it sort of conveyed the, the complexity and the interconnectedness uh, of, the, uh, of the system or which the, uh, the network in which you know, this idea, this concept of human rights and sea abuses arbitration uh, would fit into. Uh, and, and I think it's recognized in the paper itself that there is no, said, no silver bullet as you alluded to. And the presence of different actors um, performing what you said was, were complementary roles. And I thought that very much from a banking perspective, a non-legal perspective, um, complemented what Emmanuel and, and uh, James spoke to in their presentations as well. Uh, and obviously, I'm sure everybody's encouraged to hear that the banks are looking at the inclusion of human rights standards in finance agreements. Uh, and I think that's probably a, an exciting area and probably an area, probably going back to Emmanuel's comments earlier, of uh, procuring the necessary consent to making such a system work. Um, so at this juncture, uh, we have time for a brief panel discussion. I, I might just start um, uh, with Emmanuel. Um, having heard uh, James's uh, critique, and, and, I, and I understand that it, it's meant in the most constructive way, um, it, it can be said the white paper you know, neglects to engage with the realities of the shipping industry including the multiplicity of the actors that James has mentioned, and, and also the sort of the streamlined uh, expedited distribute certain mechanisms that he's alluded to in his presentation. Yes, there is one James has not addressed, which I've read in his uh, written comments, which I like very much, is that the current situation is a race to the bottom. And of course, it's cheaper to abuse uh, to abuse uh, seafarers and to not to respect environmental norms. It's cheaper and more efficient probably to bribe uh, ministers to obtain contracts. All that is true and some players in the industry compete by doing that. And we see that there is a strong resistance to that attitude and, and we see how it works. Uh, internationally for in the fields of environment, in the field of uh, corruption or embezzlement, uh, influence peddling. And, and if you take that latter example to see how 
things evolve, it takes time. But some states want to do the right thing in the field of, envi of, uh, of corruption, not, corrupt, not, not engaging in corruption, even not domestically, but even in foreign countries. The US took the lead. They had the FCPA. And then, of course, that was a disadvantage for their companies. We have to not, we cannot corrupt anyone, others do, so it's unfair. So they sponsored the international, the, the OECD convention, which to create a um, plain uh, level fee. Um, and now it's the UN convention, and it's pretty much accepted worldwide. Now, whatever the practices are is a different matter, but there is recognition and the customers are buying it. So there is incentive. Uh, it can be the banks. I was very much encouraged by Robin's uh, presentation. It can be the customers. Customers prefer to buy something a bit more expensive because it's not produced by children in, uh, in certain unregulated jurisdiction. And I think the same thing can exist for uh, human rights at sea. You may want to pay a little more for a product which has not been uh, you know, transported by uh, uh, people who would abuse um, uh, seafarers, right? So, so I think the dynamic is, is complex. It takes time. In the case of, if you take the difference between today and, and when the US started in uh, adopting the FCPA, that's 20 years. Now, I think things are going faster these days. And in this field, I think it will take less than that. But uh, one point which, which uh, James is making, to, which I very much uh, appreciate, uh, is the diversity of the situation. Currently, we have different norms, different jurisdictions, and it's a great pleasure for some of us, uh, including myself, to think in choice of law terms, what is the applicable law to that aspect, and what is the applicable law there, which forum can we, can we go to, and so on. So here, I think that's an approach which is not appropriate. What I'm suggesting is an approach which couples simple norms. I will respect, it can be even written in three lines, uh, I will respect uh, the human right uh, convention. And, and, and that's the key thing. And I will arbitrate with anyone saying I don't in this form. And the norm applicable may not be uh, any intricate applicable law, which is selected through unpredictable choice of law rules. It would be the human rights standards. And, and, but an arbitrator will be able to couple the violation with um, money or, or, or other remedies. The remedies question is another, another topic, but, but with remedies, which would be enforceable through the New York Convention. That's the offer. And it does not mean to replace all the ways to solve disputes between uh, different players in the field, which will remain complicated. If, if the you know, if, if the, the, the tort fees is insured or the violator of human rights is insured, fine, they can sue their insurance company. They can deal with that segment in their own, uh, you know, wherever they want. But the key will be to create sufficient incentive for the major players to adopt uh, some rule to do the right thing and then put pressure on the others to reconstitute um, um, uh, competition which is, which is fair and on an equal footing. So that's, I think that's the dynamic we are talking about. James, do you, would you like to react to that? Do you, do you think that people will pay for kind of this tailored, uh, sort of streamlined um, stream of, of dispute resolution? Depends who you mean by people. Um, the, Sorry, I mean, I, I've been imprecise. I mean, uh, the, the actors within the, the shipping industry. Well, well I, think, um, I think that uh, Robin and Emmanuel are absolutely right, that it's all about making the incentives um, work. And um, I personally have huge um, 
admiration for things like the responsible ship recycling scheme um, uh, and its cousin, they really ought to be in the same bed of the Poseidon principles. Um, but I, I, mean, I don't want to get lost um, in the detail of that sort of thing. But I, I do think that there is a, a point here uh, which is about bandwidth. Um, and you can also express it as fragmentation. I mean, just on the environmental um, side, uh, even if you just go down um, ship recycling, not only have you effectively got four international legal regimes, one of which isn't in force, um, but you've also got a ship recycling transparency initiative, cheap by jowl with the recycling uh, ship, sort of responsible ship recycling scheme, um, which is not, as I say, under the same roof of the Poseidon principles, even though it's this are doing the same thing. It's banks trying to get um, owners of ships to do the right thing by writing it into their um, loan agreements. Uh, and I think that's absolutely the way to go, um, or at least a way to go. Uh, obviously, one would like um, an international regulatory regime which made all of this sort of thing beyond argument, but um, the, um, uh, and you might be lucky, um, the IMO does produce some good um, environmental initiatives, um, but it's made its, uh, its life easier uh, on that score by um, some of the provisions in MARPOL, which effectively allow it to legislate. Um, but the, the difference here is that you're starting from a different place uh, in terms of the, the international regime. So yes, I think incentives, for example, from the banking sector could be very useful. That said, it's worth bearing in mind that unfortunately, since the financial crash um, of 2008, the European um, banking um, system has lost what was the lion's share um, of the, um, the loan book uh, in the shipping industry. And it's now firmly based in the Far East. And at the moment, um, as far as I know, um, few, if any, quite possibly no Chinese lenders who are now really uh, among the big players in the market have signed up. Um, so that um, is, is a worry in the sense that it's fine for all us Europeans and North Americans to think that this is a very good thing, but actually the powerhouse now is, is firmly located in Asia. Uh, and it's to um, people in that part of the world that we need to be speaking. Um, which is a, a long way of saying that I agree and it's all very, I mean, it really is very interesting and very difficult. Um, and I think the, the fact we're all talking about it um, is a good start. Thank you, James. Uh, Robin, I saw you uh, nodding vigorously, I thought, uh, to, to Manuel's remarks. Uh, did they resonate with you? Yeah, and I, I think both uh, both what uh, James and Emmanuel Emmanuel have said um, is uh, right in line with our our thinking. Um, honestly, we'd prefer to see something at the LMA level, so the Loan Market Association level, um, uh, come across on human rights. And as part of the as part of the um, uh, the Dutch banking agreement, um, we actually asked for that. Um, so I think um, all of you, maybe some of the listeners here, could could help us by um, by also petitioning for that with the Loan Markets Association, because we'd really like to see things like um, the UN guiding principles and therefore what it what it means in terms of a grievance or arbitration mechanism um, be simply embedded in all loan agreements. We think that should be the standard. Um, we don't think it should be the thing that defines um, sustainability per se. I think it, what defines sustainability should be a higher standard than that, rather than, rather than that as a base, a base standard. To speak to what James was saying earlier about Poseidon principles and, and the responsible ship recycling standards. Um, yeah, the, the conversations are happening, by the way, between both groups. So, so don't, uh, so you can, you can have some confidence that we see the challenges with having multiple regimes um, in place as well. Um, we, we, in a lot of ways, suffer from that because there's so much going on at the European level and so many different uh, obligations over the coming years that we're going to have to live up to and need to, need to really uh, plan for and implement well. 
um, in order for this all to all to come together. But uh, but I think it begins with with these being seen as common standards, not the upper standard, but the base standard for what we're expecting of of companies, and and that means everybody working together, since um, a lot of the uh, basically even even parties like governments uh, they're they're often the biggest um, buyer within a country, and therefore this is within their supply chain as well. So it should be part of their contractual agreements with others also. But uh, anyway, I don't want to rant too long on that. <laughs> uh, no ranting at all. I uh, very valuable insights, uh, I think, which, which everyone greatly appreciates. Um, I'm just conscious of time, and we want to respect the, the 30 minutes that's been allocated to general Q&A. Um, so I just wanted just to wrap up just one question on the issue of obviously transparency. Um, it's it's obviously a hallmark of international arbitration that they're generally confidential or, or, or private and held in private. And as many others outlined, there's, there's some tension between wishing to, uh, to secure transparency, perhaps analogous to the investment treaty uh, regime, and particularly given the stakes involved, and at the same time um, protecting where appropriate uh, the victims. Um, James, did I? understand your presentation to connote that you had some concerns about the, the role of transparency in these types of uh, disputes. My, my concern isn't really with transparency in, in the disputes um, per se. Um, there's a lot to be said for transparency. Um, it, it is in itself a good thing. Uh, it, it may even be a necessity in the context of employment rights. I have heard, although I don't know because I'm not an employment or a US lawyer, that in US law, some arbitration agreements have been struck down where employment rights were being um, uh, arbitrated uh, precisely because um, there was a, a lack of openness and transparency. My point, and, and it may be that there's a quite a difficult um, circle that needs to be squared here. Um, my point is more that if you are trying to get buy-in from an industry which is used to a, a relatively low-key, relatively, and I say relatively um, very carefully, low-cost arbitration system, which is also confidential, broadly speaking, it's going to be harder to get buy-in if you make it more expensive, more open, uh, and staffed by people who don't... Um, necessarily know much about shipping. That's not an attractive package to put together. And so it's just in the in the context of getting um, industry consensus that I think um, some thought needs to be given to the extent to which it is legally permissible um, to uh, have a, a confidential process um, and be uh, desirable and, and where the compromises might be drawn. And I know that confidentiality is capable of being exaggerated and the institutions um, led by the ICC are, are rather moving away from keeping their awards confidential. Um, but it, it, confidential is where it's at um, as at 2020. And I think given the innate conservatism of the shipping industry, it would be a mistake simply to say, oh, well, we must all be transparent, hurrah, because that is hurrah is not the reaction you will get from a lot of players in the shipping industry. Thank you, James. Uh, Emmanuel, any comments on that? Do you, do you think the appropriate setting, having regard to James' concern, would be to have confidentiality as the default setting from which the parties by agreement could, could uh, depart? That, that transparency for that, for this, for human rights abuses, is the right form of arbitration. To me, uh, um, confidentiality is not the, uh, of the essence of arbitration. It's a feature of many arbitrations, but it's not of the essence of arbitration. Consent is of the essence of arbitration, not, not confidentiality. It's just a feature. So I understand for shipping disputes, I understand why, trans why, why confidentiality is fine and that's, that's fine. For human rights abuses, I think, uh, I think Transparency is essential, but even for big players, they can be turned into publicity. Uh, PR, we are doing the right thing, buy my products. They are, they are brought to Europe through 
healthy um, channels, not through you know human rights abusers. Uh, it's exactly the same PR when you say buy my products a bit more expensive, but it's not it's not done by children uh, somewhere in the world. And so so I think I think transparency. There is no way. There is no way. A, a system can work if it's not uh, to 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 redress ab ab human rights abuses if it's not uh, public and fully fully transparent. But in any event, it's not necessarily a bad thing for what we want to achieve, and it may not be a bad thing for those who want to do the right thing and want that to be known. They can turn that to their advantage. It's like it's like a total funding big projects to help children somewhere in the world, right? Or, or, or depollute certain areas or, or what. Doing the right thing can be a good, a good uh, PR, uh, a good publicity vector these days. And maybe this is one which is becoming urgent. Thank you, Manuel. Um, James, I think, uh, would like to just uh, add, add one point. I just, without dissenting really um, from anything that Emmanuel has said, I think it's quite important going forward um, to pick one's vocabulary with care. Because, it, because of course it's one thing to say, well, human rights abuses must not be shrouded in secrecy. But the word abuse is very emotive um, and it is not, um, and perhaps it is, I'm not a human rights lawyer, a term of art something may contravene human rights legislation without in popular terms amounting to a, 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 amounting to an abuse and to say to the shipping industry we want your sh um, human rights abuses to be dealt with in this open forum over here it's just not a way to to garner support um, there are there are plenty of human rights violations which fall well short of an abuse uh, and of course as soon as you say we are going to allow the arbitration of human rights, you are going to have the full spectrum from what might be quite technical but important abuses, for example, a failure to investigate properly, right through to fully fledged abuses. And I just think the, the vocabulary needs to be tempered. Well, thank you, James. Um, Robin, any last minute, minute long contributions just to, to cap off that uh, very interesting discussion? Yeah, no, I, I, I think, um, first of all, transparency should be the default position, and then we can see for certain circumstances where, where there might be more confidentiality needed. But I, but I agree with uh, James as well. If we think about the outcome that we're seeking in terms of effective remedy, whatever brings the party to the tables is the path we should pursue. Um, uh, so, so if it is tempered language that, that does that, I think, uh, fantastic. Um, I do, uh, strongly believe that it's really about the outcome more than, more than, uh, the path to getting there. So, so for me, uh, that's, that's highly important given everything that we've been seeing happening in the sector.